there is now very little information that cannot be accessed. Patients with symptoms often access the web for information, and this can either reassure them or it can catastrophize their thinking. And the role of the doctor in our society is now to provide high quality information and evidence-based recommendations for treatment, guiding patients uh, to the top of the ladder on the right uh, where the patient is in control. So how did we re redesign? When I look back at the steps involved, I think the first step was building a functional team. Now, in the words of Hannibal Lecter, uh, you covet what you see every day. And in my theatre, there was a nurse who had worked with my predecessor and who demonstrated such enormous insight into what was going on that I asked her to join my team. And we sold this to management as the development of a nurse-led clinic. And from then, this particular nurse stayed on as my theatre sister and worked with me in hand clinic the rest of the week. About a year later, and spurred on by the success of the first nurse, we secured the funding for a second post. And these nurse practitioners came and worked with me in clinic and over the course of a few years became extremely competent and invaluable. And we naturally developed a horizontal team management structure, uh, which actively empowered each team member to initiate change where appropriate. Now, before talking about the redesign itself, we had to understand the numbers that were coming into our service. And because of the, of the um, situation and the locality of Fife uh, and its single surgeon service, this was relatively easy for us. When I was initially appointed in Fife, the population was 350,000. And there were five or six orthopedic surgeons, six I think, and I was the seventh. And prior to my appointment, hand surgery had been delivered by all my colleagues. So when I uh, was appointed in Fife, two things happened. Uh, my colleagues were only too delighted to give up hand surgery, having never felt comfortable with it. And secondly, we saw an increase in the number of GP referrals. So it went from about 1,200 uh, referrals per year up to around 2,000 referrals Per year and as a result the waiting times went up and management solution was to demand waiting list initiative clinics as extra contractual work to keep the service under control and over the last 10 years since around 2010 the number of referrals into my service has remained static at about 2,000 to 2,200 patients a year and when we audit what is coming in and um, the striking thing about the data is that two thirds of the work coming in from the GPs is ex entirely predictable. So one third is a carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and if you, if you take uh, trigger digits, ganglions, dupatrons, lumps and bumps, um, these groups constitute another third. Um, so, this made us question the traditional route and whether it was necessary for these conditions. We considered the, the advice that we would give them and we created pathways uh, to allow patients to access the hand service when necessary, but was unnecessary as a step in itself. Now, in 2012, my colleague uh, Lech Rymyshevsky, based in Glasgow, had been thinking along very similar lines with regard to the uh, treatment of stable fractures and their need to attend busy and oversubscribed fracture clinics. And Lech and I discussed these issues regularly. And as a result of these discussions, um, I made a decision to set up a virtual hand clinic with principles similar to those of the virtual fracture clinic. We egged each other, we egged each other on to a certain extent but in 2012, the Glasgow Virtual Fracture Clinic was born and the Fife Virtual Hand Clinic. And most of you know about the success of the Virtual Fracture Clinic because it passed a tipping point and is now standard practice in many areas across the UK 
And that's a tribute to Lech uh, and the work that he's put into it over the years. Although we didn't actively define the principles at the time, in retrospect, the objectives of the clinic were to give patients more information and more control uh, when they were referred in, whilst avoiding the need for face-to-face -face consultation. So here are our retrospectively applied principles. We changed from giving automatic appointments with a three-month wait, and that three-month wait was six months back in 2012, to an opt-in approach. Um, we, it, secondly, we decided that instead of uh, sending patients an appointment to discuss a result, we would send the result, our interpretation of the result, and a recommendation for management based on this information. At all times, patients have the opportunity to contact us and arrange a face-to-face -face appointment if they were unhappy with the information supplied or if they simply wanted to speak to someone. We initially picked the common conditions and we modified the BSSH information sheets to send to patients. Now we wanted the information that we sent to reflect the conversations that we had in clinic with the patients. And most of these conversations are, are centered around the natural history of these conditions rather than what should be done for them. And the process of agreeing the information uh, that we send to patients is a constantly evolving thing. It's not static. And over the years, we've developed uh, an, a number of extra conditions um, that we now send information on. So I've got an example of, this is one of our information sheets. It looks very familiar. It's like information sheets up and down the country. We modified the BSSH information sheet on thumb-based arthritis. But our information sheet reflects what we tell patients about this condition and um, focusing on the natural history. And, and our information sheet is likely to be very different from one that Carlos would give from, from the Povertaft unit, uh, because in the Povertaft unit, there's always innovation, research, audit going on, and many more options available to patients. Um, but we don't, um, we don't give out routinely information on, condition, uh, on, on treatments that we don't offer in Fife. So this is our, our virtual hand clinic in, in action. Um, in fact, this is a special one because we had some visitors, so there's breakfast, but the, the team attends and the project, the, the, we use a projector to, uh, to look through the GP referrals. A consensus decision is made regarding the suitability of a virtual pathway. And the information, therefore, that's supplied by the GP is critical to this process. So we can't put patients safely into pathways without reliable clinical information um, from the GP. And then we write a letter to the patient within a week of their referral, uh, explaining the reason for their referral to our service and enclosing information on the condition that they've been referred with. Uh, so patients are then asked to contact us if they feel that the information sheet is not relevant to their condition or if they want to see us face to face. And we call this opt-in, uh, but that's a relatively new name that we've given to it. So this is a win-win scenario. Patients who would normally wait three months for a consultation have immediate access to the information that we I think should be shared and if they do opt in then they're far better informed and can reflect on the issues that they want to discuss. Some patients we, we list directly uh, for surgery without face-to-face -face, and, and these patients generally have barn door uh, surgical problems. Uh, GPs can upload photographs of lumps and bumps um, but patients with a, a foreign body and a fingertip or a lump, um, we send a letter explaining uh, the options and the reason for our recommendation for surgery, and we enclose this information sheet, uh, which runs through all the things that we think patients should know uh, before having an operation. And it is essentially a consent document uh, that has a disclaimer in it. And one of our patients who's a medical legal 
a defence advocate in Scotland or a barrister uh, down in England, uh, she took a look at this for us and gave it a broad thumbs up. Um, so this then allows us to have a short but informed conversation with patients on the day of surgery, having never met them before. And, and I understand the consent process is a complex one, and this aspect of our service uh, stirs up um, uh, you know, emotive questions uh, with regard to the Montgomery process. Um, and our consent process in this scenario, uh, we've um, risk assessed it with our legal team and they have accepted our process. So the second part of our uh, clinic involves the virtual review of all results coming through the service. Now, where possible, we have given information in advance and we have discussed with patients options in advance. So when the results come in, we will then send the result or our interpretation of the result um, after reviewing the case records. Um, and we will uh, send in a letter outlining options, our management recommendation, and that's all based on our local evidence. And as many of you will know, um, radiology language reporting can be quite unhelpful because uh, they, they tend to over-report and they, they use words like torn, damaged, arthritic. And these are words that can provoke catastrophization of symptoms. Um, and they're always, almost always used to describe normal aging processes. Um, and David Ring, Professor David Ring wrote a great paper uh, looking at the language used in radiology reporting. So we interpret for the patient and we replace these catastrophizing words uh, with phrases like normal for age or stable uh, as the case may be. Now I've used um, nerve conduction study as, a, as an example um, and of course our carpal tunnel pathway in Fife is well publicized um, but it is an example of a unique pathway um, unique to our local resources uh, and there are many many ways to run a carpal tunnel syndrome and I uh, 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 carpal, carpal tunnel service and I don't want to uh, run into any arguments with um, the carpal tunnel service here but this particular result um, shows a grade two to three left and a grade four right carpal tunnel uh, syndrome in a 36 year old and, and with the GP information the GP says this is an 18 month history uh, which is par partially improved with night splints uh, no significant past medical history two children and a BMI of 31. Now we know from our database that this patient's um, chance of highest satisfaction at one year is with a carpal tunnel decompression. Uh, so that is our recommendation for this patient. Uh, we write down the options, but we recommend carpal tunnel decompression and um, we, uh, we list them directly. Had, had the nerve conduction study said, well, actually it's grade one or two, um, we would routinely send a three options letter uh, giving the patient a choice uh, of what they want to do. And, and here it is here, option number one is, well, you, you don't need to do anything here if, you, if your symptoms aren't too bad. Uh, and actually there's not, not any uh, major risk of deterioration. If things get worse, you can contact us. And then option two outlines um, what we think about steroid injections. And then option three is the, the carpal tunnel uh, decompression. So the patient, we then ask the patient to consider these options and just ring and let us know uh, what they want to do. Uh, and, and actually the split is pretty much a third of each uh, when you look at what patients choose. So, so back to our um, headline figures. And um, this pie chart uh, shows the, uh, the, you know, the numbers coming through the, uh, the triad, the GP referral system um, since 2012 and uh, ending in, in 2019 when we last uh, made the graphs. Uh, so fifth, nearly 16,000 patients triaged. Um, and if you translate this into actual figures, it's, a, it's just over 2,000 referrals a year. Before our redesign, all 2,000 would have been offered a, an appointment, but we've cut down by 500 patients per year 
the number that are coming up face to face and by 900 patients per year, the number that come to see us uh, in the hand clinic. Now, here are our results um, uh, or action of results um, since, you know, over a six year period rather than seven year this time. And again, over six years, 2000 uh, coming through a year. This group of 40% um, is a group of, of patients with just filing uh, x-ray reports and histopathology reports that we, we don't action. Um, but uh, if we say that, uh, that this again equates to 2,000 patients a year um, with 800 in the group that are actioned, um, then what we are doing is saving a face-to-face -face appointment in 600 of these patients. We're seeing back 200 of, of the 800. Now this, this graph we, we looked at just after we started the, the clinic, we had um, graphs of tippers that came through every, every month updated. And this is the last graph of, of long waiters, uh, or tipper, our word for a long waiter. Uh, and we've not had any waiting list initiative clinics now for the seven years that the virtual hand clinic has been running. So is it safe? Well. Um, this is our carpal tunnel. Uh, one of the students looked at the satisfaction rates from the virtual carpal tunnel uh, service. 171 patients, just under half had surgery, 40% um, had no treatment and a few had a steroid injection. And here are the satisfaction rates after discharge from the service. The patients treated primarily with surgery have an average satisfaction of 94 on a 100 point uh, scale or 9.4 and a 10 point scale and then um, the steroid injections are, are, are somewhat satisfied at one year uh, but the patients who've had no treatment are a bit nonplussed by the whole thing and this group of patients have norm, generally have normal uh, nerve conduction studies and we've not recommended intervention. Now I can almost hear you all thinking well uh, there's a false negative rate for for nerve conduction studies and carpal tunnel syndrome and, and that, what are you going to do about that? Uh, and yes, there is, um, but since we've published our results of, of, of surgery in these patients, uh, we are happy that the advice that we give to patients is, is good based on our, our local data. Now, this, this slide, um, you know, risk, risk is the biggest obstacle to, to redesign. Uh, and people say, well, you might miss cancer uh, and, and pa patients can't, be, uh, can't make these decisions for themselves because they don't understand. Now, this diagram epitomizes how I think of risk versus cost effectiveness. And with a fixed budget, uh, low cost, high volume care can be delivered with a ceiling to what you can offer. Alternatively, uh, you can offer high cost, uh, no ceiling healthcare, um, but only if the volume is markedly reduced. So somewhere in the middle of this triangle is a nice balance between safety and cost effectiveness. And in most units in the UK will work somewhere within this zone of the, the triangle. But every system carries a risk and it can be very difficult to see the risk um, that you have grown up in the, in the system that you've grown up in and easy to see the risk in another system. But over-investigation carries a risk and over-treatment carries a risk. And our, although our virtual hand clinic exposes us to less of that type of risk, um, it does expose us to more of other types of risk. As the years have gone by, we've started to risk assess very differently. And as our risk assessment has evolved, we've also started to take the clinic uh, further. So we now have a, an early discharge policy, which we call transfer of responsibility or putting the patient in charge. And, and that allows us to, to discharge patients, you know, without follow up after surgery uh, with them, with they, they hopefully understand uh, what we want them to know uh, and they can access the service if required uh, but we don't need to hear from them again. And we do, however, have a one-year audit 
Uh, so we get uh, feedback then about how people are, are doing. And, and as we've gained confidence in our systems, uh, we've risk assessed in, in more controversial ways and none more so than our uh, query scaphoid pathway, uh, which um, basically discharges patients from the emergency department uh, with a, a small short information sheet and a checklist. And, and patients are reviewed virtually, um, but there's no direct contact with the patient unless either we identify a problem with them uh, or they contact us with a problem. And this pathway has been running for over a year now, but we haven't done our follow-up audit. We've 300 patients have gone through the pathway uh, and six have accessed our service with a problem. And we've contacted about twice that uh, because we've found a problem. Um, but we haven't scanned every patient uh, and it's been you know, self-care uh, all the way for these patients. Now, under normal circumstances, um, there are many barriers to redesign. And I, you know, I don't want to dwell on these, but uh, traditional thinking, I think, and, and hospital IT, clunky IT systems and clunky processes, um, I have found the, the biggest barriers to redesign. And just to illustrate this, I've enclosed a copy of one of our early data collection sheets. This is how um, I know uh, what we're doing, and this is how I can present uh, the figures from our data. This is uh, the only one I have a photograph of back in 2013. But in fact, we collect data the same way now uh, because we've never been able to um, get a, a system and process in place that will collect this data for us. Um, but this is like primary school, you know, how many lorries are passing uh, at the end of the roundabout. Um, now, at many points as well, um, we found that managers, um, rather than support, put up barriers. Uh, and I should mention specifically our immediate manager, um, Fiona Cameron, um, who's, who's a, a great facilitator. So she isn't in that group. And I, I mentioned her by name. Uh, just on the off chance that she has tuned in um, and uh, is, is listening to me tonight. Um, so we've overcome, I think we've overcome um, the obstacles in our path um, with teamwork. Uh, all team members are on board and with our horizontal uh, management structure, every team member can uh, identify an issue, uh, propose a solution, initiate change with the support of the team. And over the years, I've seen a huge change in the team that I work with. They've become, you know, confident and, and actually invaluable. Uh, and they're on the brink of retirement. Uh, so that's my next uh, problem that I'm going to have to overcome. And having listened to some of my colleagues uh, down in England, uh, was chatting to Rebecca Shirley and, and Jeremy Rodriguez um, a few months ago. And they're, um, you know, the issues that they face are very different from the ones that I have faced. And um, there's another layer, um, you know, screening patients and referring in according to protocols. And, and of course, the funding mechanism in, in England is different uh, from Scotland uh, and money does not follow patients in Scotland. So there is no reward for me to see patients uh, and a huge time reward for me to do things more virtually. Uh, so I just finish up with the thought that, um, you know, my, I think that the Fife Virtual Hand Service has been a success because um, we have a fixed population with a single provider and patients get the same opinion uh, any way they access our service from the information sheets, from the face-to-face and -face, um, from the web pages and um, everything uh, pulls in the same direction um, and we understand uh, what we're you know, we all understand how to communicate with patients. And, and secondly, you know, the open access approach works really well. And surgeons have a tendency to assume uh, that if you, uh, if you leave the door open, um, a flood will come through the, uh, through the door, but that doesn't happen. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I give out my number, my, my, my email address, uh, it's all, 
it's all there for patients, but they don't abuse it. Uh, they're mostly really sensible. You do, you do get the odd um, person who harasses the secretary, but in fact, patients are very uh, responsible with all with uh, emails and, and phone numbers. Um, so, so I believe putting the patient in charge of all this is quite safe. Um, and patients, the other argument I've come across is that um, surgeons feel that they have to, the hip surgeons do this, they say, well, we need to see the patients back to get an idea as to how our patients are doing. And of course, there are some patients that you have to see back, many patients that you have to see back. Um, but we have a well-established audit in Fife, and that tells me exactly how our patients are doing at one year. And, and that audit in turn informs uh, the recommendations and the advice that we give to patients coming through the systems. So because of our thinking about risk, uh, we've given patients way more responsibility for their own care and we have had no complaints about our virtual hand clinic in the seven and a half years that we've been running it. And in fact, in our hand service in Fife, we've had one complaint in this, about, about the service uh, in, in the same seven years. And I think that reflects um, the, the fact that we work as a team and we all sing from the same hymn sheet. So, so the, the redesign is a continually evolving um, process. And since coronavirus has um, now uh, come along, actually many barriers have just been blown out the water. Uh, so for many years, we were told you can't have a website um, unless it is done through the hospital IT systems and we'll do it for you. Um, but we set one up uh, you know, when all this started and suddenly it's become standard and printed on all the information sheets without a peep from IT. Um, and then suddenly we have a, a, a system that allows us to telephone, track uh, what we're doing with patients and review uh, remotely. So, you know, our systems and processes um, have been waiting for this moment uh, for years. And when we come out of lockdown, I'm hoping that we come out um, with, without an influx of patients, uh, but with, with permanent change in the way we deliver services. And um, so I think it's a really good time to, to change. And that's, uh, that's all I've got to say. I'd just like to say thanks to, uh, to three people. First of all, to Lech Rumashevsky, who's egged me on <laughs> over the years, uh, a, a friend and, and mentor. And secondly, to um, Joe Dias, who has always reassured me when I've uh, been worried about uh, taking risks. And thirdly, to David Ring, who has hugely influenced the way I think um, about uh, patients and, and, and pain. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jane. You, you made that very clear. Uh, one, one thing that you mentioned is that, the, of course, these, the way the health system works uh, determines uh, what which way you go, and, and people from abroad may, may not know that, but in, in Scotland, the hospital gets uh, an amount of money to look after the population. Yeah. But in England, we get money per patient we see. Yeah. So do you see that as a disincentive, and how do we get around that? So, you know, I, I really have got, I, I don't know, Carlos, I mean, I think it, um, you know, it, it's like, you know, the, the nearest, I, do, I have no experience, I'm afraid, whatsoever um, of the, the system that you work in, except that I observe what happens in private practice where there is a fee associated with, um, with a, a procedure and a fee associated with a, a clinic appointment. And actually, in this type of world, unless you restructure um, how fees are paid, um, and for what they're paid, you know, how you measure activity, um, then it's actually very difficult to, to change behaviour. It is. I mean, we need to find a way to uh, uh, create a financial recompense for all the extra work that you're doing to, to triage all that. <laughs> because otherwise we, we shoot ourselves in, in the foot, really. Well, you know, there are many people that say that that's what I've done. I mean, we do have 
um, you know, we do have, um, you know, I, we could always do with an extra pair of hands. Um, you know, so it, it, it may be that, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, my services run uh, with the minimum input, but, but I think, you know, it, I don't, I don't think it's unsafe. I, I think it's, um, you know, we have an overview and have a team. It's just not a team of doctors. It's a team of, um, you know, of, uh, you know, that comprises mainly nurse specialists and physios. Mm -hmm. No, I think Harry, Harry Benjamin Lane wants to ask a question. Harry, I've, I've unmuted you. If, if you click the microphone at the lower left side, you should be able to talk. Okay. Hi, Harry. Um, hello. Uh, thank you very much for that talk, Jane. Um, that was very enjoyable. Um, wh what I wanted to ask you was how soon after you started as a consultant did you introduce a virtual for extra clinic, um, virtual hand clinic? So, and I had you had you seen any um, examples in other places? So, I, I carefully avoided um, telling you because I I thought you might all um, think that I was still in my forties if I didn't tell you, but in fact. Um, 2012 was 12 years after I became a consultant. And I, I think it was really Lech Rymashevsky and the talks that we used to have, um, you know, with the virtual fracture clinic. And you know, when, you, when you're talking about something that nobody's done before and somebody else has taken it a wee bit further and then you're sort of goading each other. Uh, and that was what really happened that year. That's how I remember it. In fact, let people probably remember it uh, very differently, but I feel that we egged each other on and, and, and then we, we had confidence because we were um, discussing and agreeing with each other um, over these things. So um, it did take a wee bit of time to, to jump, but you have to remember, Harry, that back in 2000 when I was appointed, I was the only person in the hospital with that computer and um, they didn't, you know, everything was still done by hand then. And I think IT systems have made all this much, much easier. Does that answer your question? Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question, I think, from Kohila Sigamani. Did I say uh, that right? Yes, yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much for sharing your experience. Um, I just wanted to, to know, how do you sort of um, identify patients who are like children, um, the elderly, or any of the, those patients who may not be able to reliably follow instructions or, or clearly um, so, seek access? Yeah. yeah. So there is definitely, it's definitely one of the risks of the way we do things. And, you know, we, we have had over the years fights with our readability committee um, because, um, you know, they want us to, uh, to give out information that's written for a six-year-old. And actually, that's not how I speak to people. And I know that if I explain things to people and they understand the steps, that my brain goes through to make a decision, then they are more likely to um, accept that decision or run with that recommendation. So we haven't dumbed down, I don't think, much of the information. And there is a risk that people don't uh, engage or don't understand. But we have this backup. If you want to see us, call us. Uh, and we've, it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice, I think, that, um, you know, we, because we're, we, we have one region and we're the sole provider, it, it actually, we're the only place people can come. Um, so if they're not happy, the GP writes back to us and says, look, could you maybe just see this chap? And, but actually it doesn't happen very often. Now the, the elderly are a different group. So um, the over 80s, we, we treat slightly differently. We call them the super elderly and, and we, we tend to give them a ring um, if we don't want them coming up, because all elderly patients have got something wrong with them. If they go to a GP and they're over 80, they have something wrong with them. If the GP writes about somebody that's 80 and says they've got tingling in their hands, I'm, I'm expecting somebody 
that has got no median nerve function rather than, not so much these days, but they tend to present late and present with a real problem. So we try and make, prioritize these patients. Uh, you don't want them waiting a year for pain relief when they've got two years left on the planet. What was your second part again? Uh, I can't remember the second part of your question. Um, uh, no, it was just, um, uh, it was about children. Do you, do you yeah. actually um, trust the parents? Or? So actually, um, I have I've now a disclaimer, um, and that is that I don't see children in clinic. So I, uh, if, if the patients, uh, you know, for these, the sort of under 10 kind of group, um, uh, we, we used to, to see the kids, but uh, because we couldn't anaesthetize them in our day surgery unit, then, um, you know, they, they, they go down to, to Lothian for, for children's services. Um, so we take uh, from about 10 um, upward and no, uh, the children don't go through the virtual pathways. Um, and what about the, uh, the patients with dementia? Um, so, no, we don't, you know, obviously, if we have to see the patient, we have to see the patient, and we see more patients than we don't. It's, okay. it's, uh, but, you know, we, it's, it's, it's just about making decisions. We have a set criteria for what can go through a virtual pathway, um, and, and the GP information is critical. So, uh, you know, and my team are great. So the last, we, we occasionally get um, asked to see somebody who's demented, and they live up the road from some from the nurse or in the in the home, and she says, "Oh, I'll pop in on my way home and see them." And um, so, you know, we we're quite happy to um, to to work a bit creatively with people that um, have got um, you know issues like that. Thank you, uh, Philly Matthew Phil. I think you have Hi, to. Hi, Carlos. Thank you. Hi. Um, Jane, thank you for a very enlightening talk. I have um, one or two questions. One, how are the patients reintroduced into the system if they opt in? And are they then coded as a follow-up or as a new patient? And how long do they wait? That's question one. Question two was, in the 50% group that were dissatisfied, I assume, from the ones that did not have any intervention recommended, did you experience a influx of complaints and have you encountered any medical legal issues in that group? Um, so, so dealing with the, 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 the second question first, um, no, we have no complaints about the virtual clinic, none. Um, nada, zilch, um, and uh, and because we in every letter it says if you'd like to speak to us, phone this number, and somebody will you know either speak to them or or bring them up to see me, and and of course if you sift out um, all the conditions that we sift out from clinic, um, it it frees up time, but it's time that I then spend coaching. Um, people with with chronic pain um, that you know that don't um, you know that have got problems that you know that that don't respond that aren't a pathway problem if you like so I do spend more time than I th I feel I should um, seeing patients with uh, with pain and running through pain management in people that I really can't do any anything for surgically. Now, the first part of your question, I've completely forgotten now, Philip. It's, it's regarding how patients are reintroduced into the system if yes. they opt in. Yes. Now, and actually, it as a follow-up or a new. Yeah, so, so they come in as, as return, as review patients, um, because we've had a new episode with them. And, and every time they re-access the system, they come in as a review patient. So if two years down the line, a patient rings us and says, um, uh, I've, I've actually got carpal tunnel syndrome now on the other side. Uh, we don't say go back to the GP and get a referral. We say, um, fine, we'll, we'll, would you like to be, <laughs> shall we just list you? And they say, yes, please. And, and they come in. And, and actually, that's very difficult to count. Um, but it doesn't matter in our system. It's, it's something that doesn't, um, you know, uh, there's, there's no money associated with it. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're 
looking at a huge new paradigm shift in how we deal with all these patients in the current environment. And maybe this is something that we take forward into our regular practice. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Jane, for that. Uh, th there's one further question from uh, Richard Pinder. Richard uh, missed, missed the beginning of it. Uh, but uh, Richard, I've recorded the talk and I'm going to put it uh, online later on this evening. So if you look at the Pulvatab website, you'll find it there and you can, you can watch the, the beginning again. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that watch the recording, uh, I'm going to stop it here. So uh, thanks. Thanks for watching that. Uh, stop the recording now.